enjoyed you singing all of it. It's what a blessing. Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Acts chapter 2. While you're turning, I want to remind you of something. In the first sermon of this series, and we're in a series called Serving Together, in the very first sermon, I passed out this particular card to every member. Everybody that was here on the very first Sunday got one of these cards. And uh, if you didn't get one on the first Sunday, you be sure to stop in the lobby and ask one of the ushers. They'll be glad to give you one uh, because we're going to do something very special with these at the end of the series. There are seven sermons in the series. Today I'm preaching sermon number four. On the back of this card, there's a list of ministries that we have available here in the church for some folks to get busy with and help us serve the Lord. I've already mentioned how difficult it is when you have just a very few people in the church that's doing everything. And as the church continues to grow and we have more families coming in, it's quite awkward and difficult to go to a handful of people who are already doing everything and say, hey, but I need you to do just one more thing. And so what we're praying for right now in this series, and I've mentioned that this series is more than a series. I think it's, in my heart, even a campaign. But even more than a series and even more than a campaign, it is a a message with a burden and a passion Because there's something all of us can do serving the Lord. Now, I know there will be some people that say, well, you know, I can't do it. I I have a speech impediment. Remember Brother Moses, he tried that with God. It didn't work very long. And do you remember another fellow in the Bible? His name was Gideon, and uh, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and he said, I got a great work for you. And he said, man, you got the wrong Gideon here. He said, I'm the least in my father's house, and my family's poor in Manasseh. You got the wrong man. The truth of the matter is, if you want to find an excuse not to serve the Lord, you can. The devil will give you excuses by the truckload. But it's my prayer this morning that through the Holy Spirit, in these seven sermons, God would help you to realize that little is much when God is in it. You know, we're not asking people to dig tunnels and to lay power lines and climb telephone poles. We're not asking people to do any of those things. And when you find this list here, you'll find that some of these things are very simple from putting these little blue envelopes in the pews and maybe refilling hand sanitizers. And you might look at this list and you might say, man, that's a lot of things there. But you know, preacher, I'm gifted in so many other things. Well, at the at the bottom of it, just write down what it is that God has laid on your heart, what God's gifted you, talented you to do. And at the end of the series, we're going to take them all up and it's going to be like a big puzzle for us. And we're going to lay them all out and put the puzzle together and find out who can do this and who can do that and who can do this. And that way, we don't have to go to this handful of people and say, listen, can you do one more thing? Because we're serving together. And that's what this series is all about. The message this morning is very simple. And I want you to look at the title The message is entitled, We Over Me. And when I say me, I don't want you to think pastor. I want you to think exactly where you are, where you're sitting right now, and apply this me to you. We over you, or we over me is the way that it's titled. But I want you to personalize it today. And I pray that the Word of God will speak to your heart. I want you to look with me in Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read for you several passages of Scripture this morning. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 42, and uh, I want you to follow along with me. They'll get these Scriptures on the screen for you, and some of you can read the giant print better than a smaller print in your Bible, and that's okay. We want you to bring your Bible. The Word of God is so important. Everybody should have a Bible. If if you're here today, and by the way, if you're watching on internet and you don't have a Bible, 
Uh, that's a burden to me. You let us know. You do not have a Bible, and we'll make sure you get one. And if you're here today, without a, you say, I don't own a Bible, we'll try to make sure you get one before you get to your car. Everybody needs a Bible. Now, look with me in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 42. The Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed, look at this now, were together. That means they were all on the same page. Their hearts were in harmony, and they were in unity. They were together, and the word said, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted to them all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily, again, I want you to notice this emphasis now. The word says one accord. It's amazing what God can do when his people are unified. They were in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor all with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's what happens when everybody is striving for the same thing, when everybody's unified, when everybody is harmony, this is what happens. This is what pleases God. And this is what happens. And this is the result when, when we have the favor of God upon our church. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And then look at verse uh, 32 in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. One of the many incredible things of the infancy in the early local New Testament church was that they were all in it together. And it's amazing what God can do with teamwork and unity. And so that's what we're talking about today. We over me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this joy that we have had already thus far this morning. Uh, the fellowship has been over the top, sweet and precious as always. And the singing and the special singing today, Lord, uh, it's just been a joy. And I can feel the moving of the Spirit. I can, I, I'm glad, Lord, that, that this is not a funeral service today. This is, this is the time where we have pulled up to the table of God. And Lord, we know that we are dependent on you. We want to hear from you. We want the Spirit to work in our hearts. We want to lift you up. We understand what the Scripture says. When you are, you draw all men close to you. And we believe that. And that's what we need, and that's what we desire. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here today that does not know you as their personal Savior, they would trust you before they leave. And as always, O oh God, help us not to traffic in the errors of untruth. And we will thank you and praise you for all of these things. For it's in your precious and holy name we do pray. And all God's people said, this is a true story, and I want you to listen very carefully to it. When I was preparing for this sermon a couple of months ago, I came across this, and uh, it, it fascinated me in such a way that I wanted to use it in today's message particularly. And I want you to remember the year that it happened. In January of 1926, Six-year-old Richard Stanley showed elevated signs of diphtheria. And by the way, which is a highly contagious bacterial inflammation that forms in the throat and hinders breathing and swallowing that can lead to a fatal heart attack and nerve damage by a bacterial toxin in the blood. In this particular case, this single the possibility of an outbreak in the small town of Nome, Alaska. When this little boy passed away a day later, Dr. Curtin Welch began immunizing children and adults 
with an experimental but effective anti-diphtheria serum. But it wasn't long before Dr. Welch's supply ran out and the nearest serum was in Neana, Alaska. And that was a thousand miles away from Nome. So listen to this. Amazingly, back in 1926, a group of trappers and prospectors heard about this terrible thing that was happening and they volunteered to cover the distance from Neana to Nome, which was a thousand miles. They volunteered to cover that distance with their dog teams. And they began to operate in relay teams from trading posts to trading stations. One sled started out from Nome and another team carrying the serum started out in Neana. And the story went on to say that these prospectors, they traveled as fast as these dogs could take them. And they were coming together from two different directions. They were dealing with frostbite, they were dealing with exhaustion, and they were dealing with a distance they traveled 144 hours in minus 50 degree winds. They were working frantically together. But finally, the serum was successfully delivered to Nome. And as a result of those heroic efforts working together, only one other life was lost to that potential epidemic. The sacrifice that these teams had made and working together had given an entire town the gift of life. And today, and this is what fascinated me, the annual Itatrod race in Alaska commemorates what is commonly known as the Great Race of Mercy. And it was all because Alaskans, they came together to save Nome from the diphtheria epidemic. Now you think about that. So now this morning, in comparison to that story and one that really captivated my heart, imagine just for a moment what working together in this local New Testament church, Buford Road Baptist Church right here, imagine what could happen serving together as teams what we can truly and fully accomplish and what God has called us to do. And I want to reiterate something here that we started four weeks ago, and that is this. Every single one of us here this morning, whether you want to admit it or not, it's the gospel truth. If you are saved, if you are a believer, every single one of us has spiritual gifts. You might say, not me, preacher. Yes, you. Standing at the wine press, threshing wheat, you have a gift. You might say, well, that reminds me of Gideon. And uh, But listen, did not God use Gideon in a great way? Did not God use Moses in a great way? We could go on this morning with people that tried to find an excuse with God. But I will tell you and I will assure you that everyone who is saved, you have been washed in the blood, you have been transformed, you've been made a new creature in Christ, you have a spiritual gift. We all have talents. We all have skills. We all have abilities. Every single one of us. We all have things where we are naturally wired and we all have ways in which we are spiritually wired and put together. You have things that you're good at. Listen carefully. You, God has given some of you things that you're good at where other people may feel burdensome with or very strained or very hard to do. These things you're good at, and you know what they are. If you belong to Jesus, they are intended to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and to be used for his glory. And I will tell you this, none of us, we will ever, we will never ever get to the place where we can accomplish anything for his glory in the flesh. 
What we do for God, we have got to be empowered with the spirit of the living God to do it and fulfill it. Oh, you can try to do things in the flesh for a season, but they're destined to fail and fall. If you do not have the Holy Spirit empowering you, listen carefully. There's a scripture that says this in John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. And the scripture's clear that the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But when we surrender to God, I promise you that heaven will come down. Now you might be scared a little bit of heaven on this side, but I'll tell you what, when you get on the other side, oh my goodness. You're going to come unglued. You're going to wonder why in the world you just didn't let go and let God have his way on this side of the river. It is the Holy Spirit. Now, this is how it works. God has given you a gift if you're saved. If you're born again. God has given you a gift or he's given you gifts. And he empowers us. He empowers you to use them for several reasons. He doesn't just give us gifts. You know, it's like this one day when we get to heaven, God's going to give us crowns. The word says he's going to give us rewards, but I promise you, he's not going to give us crowns and he's not going to give us rewards so that we can strut around on the streets of gold looking like decorated peacocks. That's not what it's for. When he gives us the crown or when he gives us our reward, there is only one thing that's designed to do, and that is that we all come together in this one big family of God on the other side, and we lay those crowns, we lay those stars down at the feet of Jesus. That's what it's all about. But listen carefully. God gives us spiritual gifts on this side of heaven for a couple of reasons. One, he gives us spiritual gifts that we can use them to edify, to build up, to encourage the body of Christ, and first and foremost, to give him glory. Now, what this does for us is this. Listen carefully. It destroys all the excuses of why we say we cannot serve. Whatever limitation you feel that you're dealing with right now, let me tell you something. God can work with that. You say, I don't know, preacher. My situation is in dire straits. Yeah, you think a little bit about that crowd Jesus was preaching to with all those multitudes of people and all he had was a little boy's lunch. I will tell you this, little is much when God is in it. You might be little, you might play down, you might look down at the, God can't use this. What could God possibly do with this? Listen, you give God your heart, your will, you surrender it to him and you watch what he will do with it. Little is much when God is in it. And so when we surrender this now, it destroys all the excuses of why we say we cannot serve God or why we shouldn't serve God. And I will tell you that, sure, I know it's easy to make an excuse. Well, preacher, you don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know where I've been, where I'm going, what I got going on. But listen, he knows. They sang it well just a moment ago. God knows. And so your talent, your gift, your skill has been given to you by God as a gracious way to serve him and to serve others. And it is given with a holy expectancy that we use what God has given us for his glory. I w listen, I wonder right now, and I know that I'm speaking to a lot of people on the Internet today, and I hope you're pulling uh, your, your kitchen table chair up close. And uh, I know that uh, we've been for the last couple of years, people, uh, they've got hooked on that coffee cup and that bathrobe and that newspaper. And watch the service Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. When I, I realize all that stuff. But listen, I hope that those of you that are watching, look, just get real close and personal with us today. Don't let the dog bark and distract you and all of that stuff going on. Really focus in today what we're talking about. Because I believe not only here but at home it works the same way. I wonder how many talents, how many gifts that God has given to his people that are tangled up in cobwebs this morning. I wonder how many gifts, 
How many things that God has given us that are tarnished with rust just because we're saying no? Or just because we say that my gift is not really important. What what I can do, uh, nobody will ever know it. Nobody will ever see it. And let me tell you, that's the best way God will bless you. If you want a pat on the back, listen, you can get a pat on the back. Somebody can shake your hand and maybe put a picture of you on the wall and that will be the end of it. The best gifts used are those where people never see in public. I guarantee you God's keeping the score. God knows how to reward those things. Let me say this. Think of the difference it could make for Buford Road Baptist Church and our community if we served we instead of me. And again, I emphasize that word me is not me, me. It's me, you, we. You think about this. We have to get out of the boat of selfishness and stay focused on the things that will count for eternity. In the book of Acts, we find a unified community of believers, and they are unified in a mission. And there's so many people in this particular book that are serving, and I'm only going to mention a few of them today. We could spend a lot of time talking about it, but perhaps the one more often referenced in this book, serving, is the Apostle Paul. And there are dozens of great lessons we can learn from this dedicated man. And I hope we can all still, at this point in our life, still be willing to learn. Well, preacher, I got a lot of age on me today, and you know, I've been around a long time, and there's a whole lot more I can get out of it. But I'll tell you, I I believe this, that the day we say that we can no longer learn is the day that our life starts to be unproductive. Because the truth of the matter is, I learn every day. Every one of us can learn something every day. And I promise you, the more we read of God's Word, there's not a person on this planet that has mastered this book. And the more you read it, the more you'll become fascinated with it, and you'll realize how important it is and the many things that are still left to do. But I want you to see this. I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to take just a few extra minutes to read this portion today in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, and I'm going to read all the way down through verse number 38. And I want you to look at this. The Word says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Every way the the Apostle Paul could use his gifts, his talents, his ministry, he was willing to do it. He said, But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and our faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God, And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood." For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. That word is important. We'll come back to it in a minute. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. 
sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And so the first thing I want us to see this morning, if you're following along in your outline, a couple of things real quickly. Number one is serving begins with being served. Now you may say, preacher, that sounds like a little self-centered. But here's the truth of the matter. If you have never been served, then you will probably not know how to serve. And I want you to think about that because one of the great reasons Paul knew how to serve is because he had been served so well by the church, by other believers, Ananias, Barnabas, those in Antioch and those at Philippi. But the ultimate reason that Paul knew how to serve so well is because he had been served by the Lord Jesus himself. Being served by Christ ought to transform our life. And for some reason, if there's anybody in here today or watching this morning, you feel that Jesus has never served you, then I want you to take some time to look at his cross and to look at his resurrection. And if those were the only two reasons that ought to cause us to look under every nook and cranny of our life to serve him back. Because he served us so well on the cross and even in his resurrection. The next thing I want you to see, number two here this morning, is that serving reveals a transformed heart. A transformed heart. Before we met the Lord, listen now, a typical disposition is for us to want to be served. And we talked about that just a moment ago. It was all about ourselves before we met the Lord. But at some point... You heard the gospel and you got saved. You got radically changed. The scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so when the Lord Jesus comes in and he transforms you, he saves you, you become born again, your life radically changes. Well, what change? Think about it for a minute. What change has taken place in your life since you said yes to Jesus, since you accepted him as your personal Savior, somebody might say, well, that's a no-brainer, preacher. Uh, when I gave my heart to Christ, now I'm not going to hell. But well, that's true. Now that I gave my heart to Christ, well, I have forgiveness of sin. Well, that's true, and we cannot minimize any of those. Those are wonderful things. But listen carefully. Our salvation does not stop at the cross. That's where life begins. That's not where it ends. That's where it begins. The cross and the resurrection ought to motivate us not only to serve the Lord with all of our heart, but it ought to motivate us to want to serve others as well. And serve as a team, not alone. It has to be we over me. Now, Paul didn't go about his ministry alone. The Word said, and we've read in several places this morning, that he, he gladly pulled in other people to minister with him, Barnabas and John Mark and Silas and Timothy and Luke, these were all companions of him. And I want to say to, that everyone here this morning, listen, all of us, we're on a team. We're all part of the team. And without question, when we get together as a team and we realize that God wants to move our church forward, God has a great ministry beyond the four walls of this church. Listen, I will tell you this. If we are content where we are right now and we're satisfied with me just getting up here and preaching the gospel and we want it to stay in the four walls of this auditorium, listen, people will die and go to hell all around us. The gospel is not, listen, we cannot just store the seed up in the barn. We've got to get it out. We've got to sow it and get it out. It takes all of us to do that. In children's church, junior church, nursery, Awana, young people, youth ministry, young adults connected. Listen, there's a big harvest field here. It's going to take all of us pulling together. I've already said this throughout the series that we may say that we love one another, but the true love really comes down to this is when we're motivated in this love to serve one another. Love holds the power to deeply move our emotions. I believe that with all of my heart. 
I want to share with you a couple of scriptures here real quick. Acts 20, 19, serving the Lord with all humility and mind. And I mentioned this word tears we, we were going to come back to. Look at this. And with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And verse number 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And then in verse number 37, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. And so the common denominator to Paul's service was tears. He baptized himself with tears. And then look at verse number 24. But none of these things move me, neither can I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And so when this verse gets fixed in our hearts, serving others becomes the most natural thing we will do in our life because we understand that serving others reveals a transformed heart. Number three, real quickly, we've got to, folks. We've got to start serving as a team. Serving should go on seven days a week, by the way. But obviously, our greatest opportunity to serve collectively is here on Sundays. Sundays are where we assemble and where we collectively encounter and extol the greatness of God. And this is our biggest opportunity. Sunday is the collision point where our values are most clearly expressed. Here's what I believe. I think we should expect that what happens on Sundays, it ought to influence every other day of the week. Let me say that again. Don't miss this. When we walk into the church house, listen, some, I realize some services are in, in the area, the community. Some church services is dead as four o'clock. And people, it's just a ritual. It's just a routine thing. But listen, when we come here, we come through these doors. We see the smiles on people's faces and we see people stand and shout and clap their hands and tap their feet and get excited and they're happy and God's moving in the hearts of people. You see it flowing in and out of the pew. Listen, what happens here in our church house on Sunday ought to affect our Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. It ought to carry us on the rest of the week. What happens here on Sundays is important. It's not just a ritualistic meeting and gathering. Whether somebody's here for the first time or their 100th time, we should pray that our gathering would present an opportunity to alter somebody's eternity. At the very least, their Monday morning. But it takes us all working together. Now, I've added one other point. It's not on your bulletin this morning, but I I want you to write it in if you would, if you're taking notes. Serving as a team builds our testimony. And all of us have one, by the way. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the word says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that had been with Jesus. I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward. We should not confine our servant to the Lord and the body of Christ simply to the four walls of this church. I want to say something, and this, this is not braggadociously, this is not spoken with, with an egotistic type of a thing, but it's the truth of the matter, and that is this. The testimony of Buford Road Baptist Church ought to be heralding out of these doors that it ought to be the talk of the town what God's doing at this place. People ought to be able to hear what God's doing. They they need to see what God's doing. And they need to hear you testifying. They need to hear you sharing God's glory and God's grace. They, They need a word of the Lord from you. That's what this community needs. It should never be known abroad why you can't. I mean, I hope you're not picking up the telephone and calling your neighbor and saying, well, I know the preacher's preaching that series on serving together, but you know what? I got this wife. 
I got this dog. I got this poor back. I got these bunions. Listen, we all have stuff. Do, do we not? I mean, if you don't have stuff, any kind of stuff, and I need to hook up with you because we all have stuff. All of it. Somebody's stuff might be a little bit greater than somebody else's stuff. It might be a little harder than somebody else's stuff. But here's the thing. As brothers and sisters, you know what the Word says about, about this kind of thing? That if we see a weaker brother, the object of the game is not to just step over him and keep him up. The object is to get involved with that and to help him. You, you become a servant to one another. When we start serving one another, now, not taking anything away from the Lord, He's first and foremost. But when we start serving one another, we are indeed serving Him. And when we're serving Him and serving one another, the church has to grow. It has to become strong. And so we have a God to serve. We have a church to serve. We have a community to serve. My question is this. Where will you serve? Well, I'm not doing anything, preacher. I got, I got stuff. No. Where will you serve? And we're going to take those cards up at the end of the seventh sermon. And I want to leave you with this last verse. In Matthew 25, verse 40, look at these words. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these brethren, ye have done it unto me. Wow, that's powerful. So if you ever said, well, mine doesn't count, it's just a little thing. It's just a blue envelope. It's just hand sanitizer. Just a little piece of trash. It's just a friendly smile in the lobby. Just a little handshake. Might be helping a children's ministry. Might be doing, listen, you might think that's small, but Jesus said this, when you've done it to the least, you've done it to me. That's powerful, amen. That's powerful. Before you can serve the Lord well, you've got to know Him well. You've got to know Him and the power of His resurrection. There are thousands upon thousands of people that are going into church houses every Sunday, sitting in moments just like this. They have no more idea what the gospel is than a man on the moon. They sit in churches and they hear poems and and, and, and people reading articles out of National Geographic and, uh, and uh, they, they, they believe that they've had some kind of religious experience and none of that will count in eternity. The thing of the matter is this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Him as your personal Savior? Have you ever been saved? I'm not talking about filling out a card, just sinking pastor's hand, standing in a lot. I'm talking about have you ever been saved, redeemed, born again, washed in the blood? And people try to make that all complicate it's not complicated jesus has made the gospel so plain and clear that even a little child can get in on it i was five years old when listen i did my mother led me to christ when i was five years old and that you know when i was five years old i did not sit down with her and and go through this thing well what about this and what about that and how could that be and uh, there's so many different other views and other philosophies this is what i knew I was told this, that if I didn't trust Jesus as my Savior, I was going to die and go to hell. There was no other way around that. I heard the preacher talk about it. I heard the Sunday school teacher talk about it. It was talked about in my home, and I heard this gospel thing. I heard this Jesus thing, and I heard and I learned. And she said, if you don't trust Jesus, you're going to die. I don't want to die and go to hell. I didn't say, how come this, and why is that, and but what about, listen, none of that stuff matters. I did not want to die and go to hell. I wanted to go to heaven and I realized that the only way I could do that was to ask the Lord Jesus to come into my heart 
1963 and to be my personal savior and I didn't have to figure it all out and I, I didn't listen I'm still asking questions about it I don't know why he loved he loved me I loved him I don't know why but he did he shed his blood for me he died a brutal death for me and I believe the word of God to be true and just as a little boy, see, Jesus has designed this thing of being saved so simple that a little child, in fact, he says, except one have childlike faith. Listen, I, I believe with all of my heart the salvation is so simple a child can receive it. And even somebody well up in age can know him and the power of his resurrection. And that's my question to you today. Have you ever trusted Jesus to be your Savior? You might say, well, preacher, I still got a lot of questions about that. I, you know, I, there's a lot of religions. There's a lot of ideologies. There's a lot of faiths and all of this. And I realize that. And somebody might say, well, preacher, just one person can't be right. One, one faith cannot be right. Well, let me first say this, that there's going to be a whole lot more people in heaven than Baptists. The Baptists don't have a monopoly on grace. So I do believe heaven is going to be filled with a lot of other people. But I will tell you this, not one person will be there because they trusted in Allah. Not one. Anybody that sets an ounce of his toe in heaven will be there because of the amazing grace of God, Jesus, the shed blood, the power of the resurrection, somebody opening up their heart to him. He's the only way. And if you've never given your heart to Christ, can you think of a better day than right now to do it? Let's bow our heads in prayer. And I want you to pray with me. If you've never given your heart to Christ,